Okay, everyone. We've dwindled in numbers. I'm guessing this has something to do with the fact that it's after Halloween and uh, everyone is overly sugared. I'm not going to start talking until you're done. Okay, great. Well, we have less to cover today, which I'm sure is good news for everyone. So we can take a little bit more time, and I've got some interesting examples at the end, um, talking about groundwater. The first, talking about groundwater contamination, and we're going to look at uh, the Fukushima plant in Japan and look at the problems that they're experiencing there with radioactive material that's getting into groundwater. Um, and how they're going to try and address that. And also then we're going to look at our water here in Southern California. I think it, if, it's, if you're going to be living in this area, you need to be aware of the water issues that we are experiencing in California. And in particular, when you turn on the tap, where does your water come from? It comes out of the tap, which is great. We all rely on that. But where does it actually come from to begin with? Because clearly we don't get much rain. So the quiz five is available this weekend. It may be a little bit tricky. Um, I've got a couple of good questions in there. I was very proud when I came up with these questions. So um, have a go at them and think through logically. Um, please remember, I keep getting people submitting more than three times, and for every extra time you submit, I take a point off your score. So please don't submit more than three times. Um, and then the reading is listed up there for this class. It's less to cover today. So we're going to continue looking through the hydrologic cycle. And on Wednesday, we talked about what happens when we get precipitation and that water flows on the land, on top of the land where we can see it. That's actually a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the fresh water that's actually out there. In fact, 30% of our fresh water on Earth is actually groundwater. You can see it there. It's actually contained within the soil and rock. And it is sort of precipitation that falls. It gradually seeps into the earth and into the rocks. And then very, very slowly, over hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, if not longer, it makes its way to the coast and flows back into the ocean under, under the surface. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And it's a really important resource for us in particular. So this is just to remind you that the vast majority of earth, water on Earth, 97%, is actually in the oceans. But the fresh water is what we as, as a civilization need in order to function. Um, and in particular, if we're not talking about ice caps and glaciers, which contains the other 70%, but certainly not around here, most of our water supply is going to come from groundwater. So it's worth knowing a bit about. And I think all of us are familiar with the idea that if we dug down deep enough, we'd probably hit water. In the desert around here, you'd probably have to dig down a really, really, really long way, but eventually you would hit water. Um, and this is sort of our basis for getting water in a lot of the, the previous uh, centuries, was we would dig wells, and people would get water out of the bottom of the well. So we're familiar with the idea that there is water down there. Um, so let's just put a few more scientific terms and concepts around that idea. Okay. So groundwater, when I talk about groundwater, I just mean all of that fresh water, or it could actually be salty in some places, all of the water contained within the spaces in bedrock and within sediment and soil. Okay. And when we talk about how much water there is in a particular type of rock and how easily it flows through, we talk about two different things. We talk about porosity, the top term there, porosity, and permeability. So porosity is just basically how much open space is there that we could get water into if we tried. That's our porosity. And it basically controls how much water we can physically get into our rock or into our sediment. But in some cases, what we really want to know is permeability. So less how much can we get in it, how easy is it for that water to move through those spaces. So basically, it's a measure of how interconnected those spaces are. So you can see that on my left-hand diagram here, we've got lots of equally sized sort of grains of rock. And there's lots of space in between them, which can be filled with water. And you can imagine that in sort of a 3D structure, then there's actually plenty of places where that water can flow. So this one on the left-hand side has both high porosity. We can get a lot of water in there but also high permeability. 
it would be relatively easy for water to flow through it. Okay? And so you can imagine that at, at the beach, sand is a really good example. Sand, if you look at beach sand, most of the grains are more or less the same size. And when you see if you pour water onto beach sand, it just goes straight in. Okay? So that's a good example of high permeability. Our middle example, you can see that instead of just having grains all the same size, now we have quite a range of different size grains. And those, if you imagine you had sort of ping pong balls and sort of M&Ms or something in a jar, then those M&Ms would fill in the spaces between your ping pong balls. So what you're doing is you're reducing the available space for water to fit in there. So we have a lower porosity in this case. Um, and usually associated with lower porosity, it's usually more difficult as well for that water to flow. And lastly, on the right-hand side, we have an example of a rock where we could theoretically get a lot of water into it, or it could contain a lot of, rock, uh, of water, because we have big pore spaces. But in this case, what we've had is we might have had um, crystallization or cementation just like we talked about when we talked about sedimentary rocks, you might have crystals growing in that space which blocks off each space from the next. And so in this case, even if we can get water into those holes, then those holes aren't connected to each other. And so it's going to have a low permeability. It's going to take a really long time, if at all, for water to travel through that rock. Okay? So that's porosity and permeability. So, first eye clicker of the day, wake you up a bit. How permeable is most concrete? So, how permeable is most concrete? Couple more seconds. Definitely down in numbers today. Is no one excited by groundwater? Okay, so let's take a look and see how people are doing today. Good, good work. Okay, 66% said not permeable. Okay, how do we know it's not permeable? What happens when we pour water onto concrete? It just goes sideways, hopefully. You're in trouble if you pour water onto your concrete and it sinks through, okay? Our houses, our buildings are made of concrete. We don't want it. It's designed not to be permeable. Interestingly enough, though, that has a side effect because we were talking about how when there's rainfall in, in a lot of places in the world, what happens is that rainfall gradually, some of it at least, sinks into the ground. But in places where we've concreted over large surfaces, like most of L.A., then actually that water can't sink into the ground. It instead runs straight into channels. And that's why sometimes in urban areas you get much higher risk of flooding because we're not putting water back into the ground. It's just flowing across the surface. And so there's a faster response time to rainfall events. Okay. So concrete is a good example of something that isn't permeable when we want it to be. Some engineers are now trying to make concrete that is permeable, that we could sort of pave areas that we could allow water to sink through, but mostly we don't want it to be. And in the natural environment, things that are impermeable are things like clay. So where you get clay layers, clay instead of being nice round grains, it's lots of thin flat grains, and that forms sort of barriers. You can imagine when I said if you poured water onto beach sand, it would go straight through. If you pour water onto clay, it doesn't really go through, it sort of runs off to the side. So clay, whenever we see clay in sedimentary basins, tends to sort of form or form places where we can collect water on top. Okay. So I wanted to mention something about groundwater chemistry, because this is going to be your challenge for your discussion activity next week. I'm going to give you five mystery water samples from the sea, from the Newport Back Bay, from tap water, pure distilled water from our labs and bottled water, and you're going to do a bit of testing, and you're going to see if you can work out from the equipment we give you which is which. Okay, so this is your challenge. So I wanted to mention a little bit about groundwater. Groundwater naturally contains lots of elements. It has some calcium, it has some magnesium, it has some carbonate, it has some fluoride in it. 
and it really should. It's, it's meant to be there because, remember, our rainwater, when it sinks in, is slightly acidic. It's also acidic in the soil because of all the carbon dioxide produced during respiration, breaking down material in the soil. And so that slightly acidic water is going to dissolve away the rocks and minerals that it's in contact with. So it contains uh, calcium and magnesium, and usually that's actually really good for us. Uh, sort of it, it contributes to some of those required minerals that we need. Um, and how much of those dissolved minerals is in there affects the water chemistry, um, and in particular the things that affect how much is in there is things like the amount of time it spends in contact with the rock. If it flushes through really quickly, then it's not going to have much time to dissolve away material, and so it's not going to have as much dissolved material in there. Um, also, just the, the amount of rain. So in some really arid areas where the groundwater sits there for a long time and there's not a lot of it, then you get a lot of dissolution and, and that water can become undrinkable. It can contain so much chlorides or fluorides that it's not terribly good for you. And we notice this because have you ever looked, does anyone actually own an electric kettle? I know this is America and you don't do the electric kettles. Yes, one person at least, a few people. It's really easy, guys. You shouldn't bother with the boiling stuff, just the, the electric kettle works. And what you see inside is that you get minerals precipitating out on the, the heating element in there. And the same thing happens in your boiler. You get minerals precipitating out. Um, and that's especially bad in industrial processes. Um, and so we call something hard water or soft water. If it has lots of minerals in it, it's hard water. If there's hardly anything, we get soft water. And if you notice that in some places around the country, around California, around the world, you have to put a lot more soap in your water to create lather, it's to do with how many elements are in there. So with hard water, you have to add a lot more soap before you can get things to get foamy, whereas with soft water, it happens straight away. So there's lots of cool stuff with groundwater chemistry. So, but if you were to dig a well, a well, you wouldn't just sort of scoop out a hole and there'd be water there. If you were to dig a well, then first of all, you would go through what we call the zone of aeration, where the pore spaces are basically filled with, water, uh, with air. Okay? So we have open space. If you were to go and dig a hole out there, not in the park because we water it to death, but just somewhere where there's not much watering, you would get air in those pore spaces. And then if we go deep enough, we hit the zone of saturation, where we actually get water in those spaces between the sediment grains and within the rock. And if you've heard of the water table, that blue line at the top of that zone of saturation is what we call the water table. It's the upper surface of the saturated zone. Okay? So I'll pause for a second so you can write that down if you need to. Okay, so how do we get water into these spaces to begin with? Well, first of all, the process by which we add water back into our groundwater is called recharge, okay? It's that replenishment, and it can be rainfall, and that rainfall will sort of fall on the soil and sink down. It can also be snow melt. So up in the mountains, we get all of that snow piling up. In spring, if it melts slowly enough, we can get that snow melt sinking into the ground. If that snow melts really quickly, then what happens instead is that the top layer becomes saturated and more of it runs off into streams. And then that water moves down because, due to gravity until it joins with the saturated zone. It hits the water table. And then it can flow. And it will flow really slowly. It's flowing through rock, but it will flow. And it will flow to areas of discharge. So wherever our water table hits the surface, we see water at the surface. So where you see a lake, it's because the water table has hit the surface. If you see a stream, the water table is at the surface there. If you see springs, natural springs, it's where the water table hits the surface. Okay? And the thing about water and groundwater flow is it doesn't always go downhill. This is a funny idea for us, but sometimes it can go up, and it's to do with the overlying pressure of water in a different place. Okay? Because remember, water is incompressible. So if you press down on one side, the other side has to go up. Okay? So we have this recharge and discharge going on. Um, and so we see it coming back to the surface as springs, as lakes, as streams, and eventually it goes out and meets the ocean. Okay. <clears throat> 
So if you imagine, if you're taking a sort of rainfall and it travels at a really shallow depth through the surface of the, the soil and it reaches the stream, it probably didn't take that long, maybe just a few days or a few weeks. If it sinks down deeper and has to flow further in order to reach its sort of zone of discharge, then actually it can take a really long time. And we can find areas in the US where the groundwater is hundreds of thousands of year, years old. So that water fell as rainfall a very, very long time ago. And it's taking this really long time to, to reach its point of discharge. And the problem is, is that if it's, if it's taking that long and we remove some of it, it's going to take that long to replace. So if we're removing all of that groundwater in, say, 50 years, but it takes millions of years for water to come down and replace it, then we're not using groundwater sustainably. We're taking it out much faster than it can replace itself. And not only that, but we need to think about what happens to the depth of the water table. So you can imagine that at different times of day out in the park, you're basically at water table at the surface um, because of all the watering, but say in the middle of the day, you might have to dig down deeper. So the water table depth can change through time and with different conditions. So first of all, our water table changes with topography. It more or less mirrors the overlying topography, so hills and valleys, um, but it's, it's not quite as extreme. It's sort of damped down a bit. Um, and it also changes with climate. So in our dry desert climate, you'd have to go down a long way before you hit the water table because there's not much rain. Um, whereas in a wet climate, you wouldn't have to go down as far. I know that's really blindingly obvious. Um, and then also it changes with um, the season and also year to year. So if we have a particularly dry year, then our water table will be much further down than in a wet year. And so often when we draw diagrams, we'll, we'll draw both the wet season water table, which is the upper paler blue line there. So we have the zone of aeration marked in brown. Then we have the wet season water table marked in that pale blue, and then the dry season water table. So where there's water all year round marked in that dark blue there. Yes? It looks like the water table's kind of intersecting with that lake. Is that... Yeah, absolutely. So you can see, remember I said that where that water table hits the surface is where you see water at the surface, so at streams or at lakes. So here you can see that our, where our water table sort of fits through the landscape is where the level of our lake is. Okay? And you can see that where we have our stream running through, that's where our water table runs past. Okay. So these are things that you might want to think about if you want to dig a well. And we've got lots of springs around here. So who's been out to the desert and has found springs somewhere? No one? You guys need to go and explore a little bit more, I think. OK, so whenever you get springs um, at the surface, and that's where the water table is meeting. And it can happen in two ways. First of all, just if your ground surface dips a little bit and you get a spring. But also, it can happen where we have some impermeable layer underneath something that is permeable. So our example here is we've got sort of shale, so clay-rich rock, which, remember, is not very permeable. Water will just run off it. And sitting above that, we have limestone. And limestone has lots of nice spaces. It's easy to dissolve. So we create lots of porosity and permeability. And you can see that the, the water is sat above the shale layer in the limestone. And then when it hits the surface at the base of that cliff, it runs out as a spring. OK. So often you get springs here. You sometimes get springs at faults as well, where um, the water can reach the surface. And when there's enough groundwater that we get interested in it, so when there's economically significant quantities of groundwater, we call that an aquifer. So you've heard of an aquifer. It's an economically significant quantity of groundwater. And we drill into that to create springs and to, to create wells. And so things that make good aquifers are things that are very porous and very permeable. So things like gravels, sands, sandstones. And we have two types. We have what we call an unconfined aquifer, which unsurprisingly is unconfined. Um, so it might have a lower limit, a lower boundary where we're sitting on top of something impermeable, but there's nothing sat on top of it or to the sides necessarily that stop it moving. It's an unconfined aquifer. 
And if we drill into an unconfined aquifer, then we can extract water, we can pump water to the surface. But as we do that, look at what happens to our water table. As we're removing that water, we get what we call a cone of depression because we're removing it more quickly than it can flow in and replace. Because remember, flow through these rocks is really slow. So if we are not careful, then we can create our own sort of wells drying up. Um, and especially if you look, if we drill a nice big well next to a shallower well, then the big well is probably going to capture a lot of that water and we're going to leave that shallow well much drier. Okay? This is a problem in the Midwest especially where we have had droughts and uh, people get very aggressive with their neighbors because they go, you are drilling and, and you're capturing all my water. So we have to be careful. So we have our second type of aquifer. And this is a confined aquifer. And unsurprisingly, it is confined by impermeable layers below and also above. Okay? And this does something funny. Because if I held a hose pipe and it's full of water, okay, if I raise one side of it, what's going to happen? So if I have my hose pipe sort of as a loop and it's full of water, what happens if I raise one side? Water comes out of this side, right? And it's because, again, water is not compressible. And so the, over, the extra weight up here is forcing water down, and it comes out of this side. Okay? And the same thing can happen with aquifers, because often we're recharging our aquifer up high in the mountains, where we get more rainfall, we get more precipitation. And you can see that that water then fills in this, this basically like a pipe or a, a sort of a, a sheet of water. And if we can drill into it, down where it's lower, then actually we can get water to come up to the surface by itself. And this is called an artesian well, if the water just rises by itself because of the weight of what's further uh, up in the aquifer. And uh, can anyone think of any region around here which might be related to this? Does anyone live in Artesia? No? Is it too far away? So that's, we have a lot of wells, artesian wells, um, in LA, and that was uh, from Artesia. Unfortunately, they don't work so well now because we've taken out too much groundwater, um, but this is something that LA made use of in the past. Okay, so here's our artesian wells. So my question for you is, here are four potential sites, and you're in charge of deciding where you're going to build your aquifer. So I want you to think about, so you can see your impermeable layer, so it's clay or something, and then you've got your aquifer, and then you've got your town on top of the hill. So which site would you choose? Talk to your neighbor, see if you can persuade them. So think about things like depth of the water table, how far you would have to drill. How reliable would that water supply be? Okay, has everyone had a chance to vote? Okay. So most people would say D. Why would you say D? Why did someone pick D? Sorry? There's a lot of water. It's shallow. You wouldn't have to, have to dig so far down. Why might someone pick C instead? It's closer. If you're feeling lazier, if you don't want to go as far to get your water, then you might pick C. You have, you have to dig more, though, so you might have to look at how much it costs. And this is the sort of process. What's There's a lot of pressure over site B. Would it just, is that like an artesian well? It just go to the surface? So it doesn't show on here. So it's probably not an artesian well, unfortunately. We don't have an overlying impermeable rock that's drawn in here. But otherwise, it would have been a good option. Okay. So I, I would agree with C and D on the basis that there's more water. If you can imagine if you have a really dry year, 
If you have a really dry year over at site A, then you don't have very much thickness, um, whereas you do at C and D. But I would take both of those answers. It depends on how much it costs to drill, how much it would cost to transport back up the hill. And it's one of those things that there is necess isn't necessarily a right answer. If you can justify your answer to me, I'll take it, as long as it's actually right. OK. So, so let's talk about groundwater as a resource for humans, because really this is where we're interested in groundwater. And so who recognizes this photo? Yeah, OK. It's the aquifer carrying water down from Northern California to us, down here in Southern California. So the problem is, is that there are so many of us now, and we're affecting um, a larger part of the Earth's surface. And so our quality and our quantity of fresh water is really very much under threat. Um, so in terms of quality, 1.2 billion of the 7 billion of us worldwide don't have access to clean drinking water. And that's a very significant number. Um, and we also get contamination of groundwater all the time from things like landfill sites, where all those toxic chemicals of things that you throw out sink down and into the water supply from urban and agricultural runoff, you can imagine in the Central Valley, where those really horrible smelling cow farms are, then you probably wouldn't want to extract water from underneath those things. Um, mining is also another big one. If you use acid a lot in um, mining, and that can get into the groundwater. Septic tanks, petrol and uh, gas stations, all these sorts of places. And we also have problems related to quantity of water. So the transfer of water from even from Northern California, so even within our state, causes an awful lot of political tension. Um, and there's a lot of different people that get upset by this. Um, and that's fine. And that's within our state. What happens when you have to negotiate, perhaps, with several states, um, like we have to do over the Colorado River allocations? What happens when Mexico doesn't get any water anymore because we remove so much of it from the Colorado River that it dries up before it enters Mexico? So there's all of these sort of pretty significant issues. Um, it's especially true in the Middle East, where they're also very water stressed and there's already political tension, um, as well as environmental issues. So up in the Delta, there's lots of in, uh, there's particular endangered fish, and they're concerned about what will happen if we're removing a lot of the water from up there. And also, just excessive use of groundwater locally for us can cause quite significant damage. So lowering of that water table to begin with, so shallower wells can run dry, um, springs drying up, subsidence and seawater intrusion. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about subsidence and seawater intrusion in a second. So first of all, there is an extra credit opportunity, and a particularly good one. Okay, So for 10 points, okay. There is a screening of what we call last call at the Oasis. Kurt, are you in this one? No, he's not in it, but his research group, this has um, formed a large part of this documentary. And Jay Miglietti is a professor in our department. And he works on all of these issues, on, on sort of groundwater quality and the amount and what we're doing to it and using it sustainably. Um, and so I think it's the, the law department are actually um, showing this. but. Um, they have said that you would be welcome, so your job for 10 points would be to go and watch this film and write me one page, not, not even that, just a couple of paragraphs about what you think, about the issues that are brought up, um, about how we're going to address this in future. Um, so, and you even get food and drinks provided if you go. So can I get a rough show of hands? Who is interested in going to this? Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I have... I said that I would give them a rough number today, and that's like at least 150. But if you wouldn't mind RSVPing, then that would make sure that the room is big enough and that there's enough food and drink for everyone. So it's in your best interest. So if you could please RSVP, that would be really helpful. It's a really good documentary, um, and Jay Familietti is going to be uh, there afterwards to answer questions. It's really worth, worth seeing. Has anyone seen it before? A couple. OK, well, <laughs> you can see it again. OK, so let's talk about groundwater contamination. So here are some of those sites that I mentioned. And what you can see from the flow diagrams is that where groundwater is flowing in one consistent direction, we can get a sense of where that contamination is coming from and where it will go. When we, when we drill big wells and we create cones of depression, then actually we can 
interrupt that flow of water. So there's, there's, but there's lots of things on here that can affect things like septic tanks, salt piles, um, garbage landfills. All of these things introduce contamination. And once that contamination is there, the difficult thing is it's really difficult to treat and remove. So you don't have one body of water that you can try and filter anything. You've got lots of water in little pore spaces deep down in your rock. It's going to be really difficult to filter out a lot of these chemicals. And so it's a really slow, expensive, um, time-consuming process to do this. Um, and it's increasingly necessary if you engineers in the room. Um, this is a good field to get into. Um, so let's look at our case study. So Fukushima, Japan, I was trying to put together a series of slides and I found that I think it's the Washington Post has by far the best little description of what's going on. So I'm going to show you with diagrams what happened. So hopefully everyone is aware that the Fukushima nuclear plant was operating on the coast of Japan at the time of that enormous uh, 9.0 earthquake back in 2011. And not only that, but it was right at the coast and it experienced a 46-foot tsunami. Imagine 46-foot tsunami. It's incredible that it still functioned at all. But after that, it knocked out quite a lot of the cooling system. And unfortunately for uh, this location, um, there was sort of a cascading series of events which meant that um, radioactive material was released from some of the reactors that were functioning at the time that the tsunami hit. And that some of that was released into the atmosphere in the form of aerosols. And we talked about how we were very worried in California and we didn't need to be. Um, but more worrying is that a lot of that sort of surrounding soil and also a lot of water was contaminated at the same time. Not only that, but to prevent further disaster, we had to try and cool these things. Okay. And so after that, since then, we installed a cooling system that goes through and cools a lot of the, the fuel rods um, to prevent them catching fire and releasing very, very nasty radioactive material into the atmosphere. And you can see that water circulates around and then it's filtered as it comes out, but still that water is somewhat radioactive and so it gets stored on the site. And I think now they have something like 400,000 tons of water and it gets continually cycled around, okay? And that's all very well, but these tanks were definitely built sort of not thinking of necessarily the long term as we just had to build something there. And so they were built with rubber seals, which aren't necessarily terribly good. And in August, about 80,000 gallons of pretty radioactive um, water escaped from one of these tanks um, and leaked out. Um, not only that, but just rainwater in general and other water has been collecting in these reactors in underground rooms, in underground uh, areas, um, and especially you've still got all of that seawater um, in some of these places. Okay? And so we've got a lot of radioactivity around there, and we are right at the coast. And then our problem is that we sit on nice permeable soil. And so each day, about 800 tons of water flows through this site to the ocean. And that's not really a very good thing, because we don't want that radioactive material, that really quite radioactive stuff, to escape into the ocean, because it starts affecting marine life. Um, it takes probably about a year and a half for that radioactive material to circulate around the Pacific before it might reach us. Okay? And yes, it would be sort of mixed by then, but still we don't really want it around. And especially already they've banned fishing in this area because of what's escaping out. So right now we don't want that water to hit the sea, but there's not really a lot we can do about it. So about 400 tons of that, about half of that is drill, is sort of pumped out every day and stored. And it's stored until we can test it and show that it's not radioactive and damaging, and then we can release it out to the ocean. But the other 400 tons actually does go through the site and out to the ocean and is taking some contamination with it. And the problem is that, that this just isn't sustainable. There's going to be more leaks, and we need to contain this in a much more permanent way. Okay? And so our next step is to try and sort of prevent new... Um, some of that extra water from actually reaching the sea by pumping it out and filtering it. And we're installing glass walls 
down here to try and prevent that water reaching the sea, but that's also not terribly sustainable. So instead, what they want to build is we're going to be drilling 100 feet down all the way around that very sort of radioactive site. And we're going to be running cooling fluid through it. And what we're going to try and do is basically create a frozen wall of soil all the way around. Okay. And what that will do is it will contain the water that's already in there and allow us to pump it out and filter it and try and treat it. And it will also prevent new groundwater flowing in. And the nice thing about this is that it takes a lot of energy to run and maintain, but if something happens to that electricity supply and it shuts off, it will take weeks for that wall to melt away. So even if there is a brief interruption, say if there's another earthquake, another large earthquake, it wouldn't cause there to be massive leaks out. So it's actually a very interesting system. It's going to cost at least half a billion dollars, but that's nothing compared to what's already being spent to try and treat this site. So this is a, a, a good example of groundwater contamination and the sort of lengths to which engineers would have to go to try and fix these problems. And um, once it's down there, it's difficult to, to get at. So let's talk a little bit about LA. So the main problem we have with fresh water on Earth is that the supply doesn't meet the demand. It's not because there probably isn't enough fresh water around, it's just that it's in the wrong place. If we think about where our, most of our fresh water is, it's sort of in the high latitudes or around the tropics. If we look at where most of the people are, that's not where, that's not where we are. Okay? So just like LA, most areas around the world have a higher demand than they have a supply for fresh water. And that's even true in England where it rains all the time. Okay. So I said that when we don't use groundwater sustainably, when we take out more than we replace, we have problems associated with that, um, and we have subsidence and seawater intrusion. So here is an example of subsidence, and it's from our very own Central Valley here in California. And the signs on that little post there show what level the ground surface was at in that year. Okay? So in 1925, the land surface was basically up there. And the reason that we've dropped quite so far is because we're pumping out so much groundwater. Isn't that insane? And that's 1977. If we went back there today, it would probably be even further. Okay? And what's happening is, is that as we pump out that groundwater, then we're leaving behind open space in the rock. And there's enough overlying sediment that it basically just squashes down. It compacts. And we then are destroying the porosity. We actually then couldn't get groundwater back in, but also the whole surface sinks. And this is happening throughout the Central Valley. And it happens even if you look at University Drive, we're getting subsidence there. Okay? Um, so it's not sustainable. We're not treating our groundwater properly. Where we have removal of groundwater near the coast, we get what we call seawater intrusion. And the idea is, is that normally, if we have our aquifer and it's flowing down and that water is reaching the coast, there'd be a zone where you're sort of mixing salt water in the pores of the rocks with fresh water. And that's fine. We make sure that we don't build wells near it or whatever else, but it's okay. The problem is, is that if we then build a well and extract some of that fresh water just in land, then the seawater can come further in. Okay? It's going to fill that gap left behind as we pump water out. And that means that if it can come far enough in, it can start poisoning our groundwater supply because we can't irrigate crops, we can't drink salt water. And so this is a big problem along coastal South California, including here in Orange County. And so the way that we can fix this is a pretty expensive way, but it works, is that we drill a second well even closer to the coast and we pump fresh water back down. It doesn't seem terribly constructive if we're removing some and pumping others, but um, it, it works. So, let's look at where our water comes from. Where you switch on your tap, where does the water come from? So here, for us in northern Orange County, 60% of our water comes from groundwater that is fed and recharged by the Santa Ana River. Okay? 
Um, and during summer, most of that water is actually coming down from water treatment plants in Riverside and San Bernardino counties. But actually, they're getting much more efficient with their water supply as well, and so we're getting less from them in the summer. 40% of our water is brought in from uh, the Colorado River or from Northern California, um, either the Eastern Sierra or even further north. In Southern California, uh, sorry, we are in Southern California, in Southern Orange County, so even further down the coast, maybe around Laguna, all of their water is imported. They don't have a nice drainage basin with groundwater, and so they have to bring in all of their water supply. And if we look at California as a whole, 70% of the, of the rivers have been engineered to redistribute water. I think that's a crazy number. Okay. So let's look at what happened last year and where our water supplies are at. So this is a, a figure I've taken from um, the Orange County Water District report. They have lots of information on here. So you can see that our snowfall in 2012 was only about half of what we usually get. And as we go forward in time with warming temperatures, that's something that we could probably expect will continue. Our reservoirs right now are somewhere sort of 74% to 93% full. We had lots of late storms last year, which allowed us to, to fill up some of these reservoirs. Um, but if you look at further inland, the Lake Powell and Lake Mead reservoirs are more like 50 or 60% capacity. So those are, are definitely somewhat down. Okay? Um, and so if we think about the future of these water supplies, the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains is likely to decrease in the next 100 years. Our groundwater, we're not using it sustainably. We're seeing subsidence. We're seeing seawater intrusion. We're taking it out faster than we can replace it. The Colorado River contains a lot less water. Um, there's been drought. Um, in 2003, our allocation from the Colorado River was cut by 50%. Um, and that's probably not going to go up any time soon. And our sort of savior, our water coming from Northern California, from the San Joaquin Delta, is pretty controversial right now. And they're talking a lot about delays um, in improving our supply. So is anyone feeling hopeful about the future of water in Orange County? Yes. <laughs> so we have one wild optimist over on one side. But we need to really think about how we're going to um, sort of supply water for our population, especially as our population grows and especially as we might see changes to supply and demand due to climate change. So we need to start thinking about other things. We need to think, think about being more efficient, perhaps watering less of our landscaping, um, but also things like desalinization, which has its own challenges because it's so expensive and it's so energy uh, sort of hungry, and also reclamation and recycling. Okay? Does anyone know about the reclamation, or why shouldn't you drink the the sprinkler water around here. Because it's, it's reclaimed, right? It's sort of recycled water, OK? But one possible solution to our water issues is to drink recycled water. So would you ever drink water that was recycled? Would you drink water that had been in the sewer, and then it gets presented, OK? So it was in the sewer, and it has been treated, I would like to add, OK? <laughs> Last few seconds. OK. Let's take a look. So most people say maybe. 25% say never in a million years. And I have some uh, unfortunate news for you. You already are. OK? <laughs> so this isn't meant to prevent you from drinking tap water ever again. But we already have an amazing treatment facility. It's really the best in the world. People come from all over to visit this. And it's right on our doorstep. It's called the Orange County Groundwater Replenishment System. And what we do is we take, uh, so you can see that the Orange County Sanitation Department gets all of this sort of waste water, and it treats it. And what, what it sends out is either sent out to the ocean through a pipe and it's released far offshore, or it's what we use for the landscaping um, around here. But we now have another treatment plant, this, this reclamation plant. And what that does is it takes the water coming out of the sanitation department, and it puts it through another series of treatments. <laughs> 
And what you get at the end is water you can drink. And it takes about 40 minutes. It's about a third less energy than actually desalinizing everything. Okay? And we produce, I think, enough water for 600,000 people every year. So of the 2.4 million people in Orange County, about 600,000 people's worth is actually from this. And it doesn't go straight back into our water supply. What actually happens, not because it couldn't, but because of psychology, because we go all go, oh. It actually goes back. And it, what they do is they put it into these basins up at the top, those little circles. They put them in their little ponds that are sat on top of really permeable rock. And that water seeps back down and recharges our groundwater reservoir. Okay. And it's absolutely perfectly drinkable. I've drunk a glass, and I'm still here. Did you drink a glass when you went? Kurt drank a glass. He's still here. Um, so we're perfectly healthy. It's fine. It's, it's clean water. In fact, it's often cleaner than what you would get from bottled water. Okay? So there's a reason behind this. And also, you can see on there is marked a seawater intrusion barrier. That's because we are seeing seawater intrusion in Orange County. Where that green is coming in, so here's we have actually five different confined reservoirs underneath us right now, and we actually pump water from all of those. But because we've been pumping out water, seawater has been intruding in and started to poison our supply. So what we have now is this line of injection wells that pumps water back into all of these different reservoirs, and it forms this little line, each of those black dots there is an injection pump, and so we've actually managed to solve our problem. Okay, So it's a really cool thing. You can visit it. So things for you to think about over the weekend. Um, and on Monday, we're going to talk about the cryosphere. Okay.